Take your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 3. Pick up verse 1. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. I want to preach on verse 1 and 2. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, and not on the things on the earth. This morning I'd like to preach a message on the desires and affections of heaven, or the joys of heaven. And I want to preach on heaven this morning. About every four months I'll take and flip through my dad's old Bible, and I'll look for outlines in it. And uh, this outline is one that I took out of my dad's Bible, and it's a message that kind of jumped out at me, and I want to preach it this morning. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll take and uh, be with the message this morning. I pray that you'll bless it. I pray that our eyes will not be focused on the things of this earth, but that we'll be focused toward you and toward heaven and toward eternity. And I pray that you'll take and wash me now in your precious blood. I pray that you'll fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'll speak through me this morning and uh, give us a message that will speak to our hearts and uh, turn our hearts towards you and uh, have our affections where they should be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, uh, we take and go through earth, this earthly life it's like a vapor it's a short time that comes but to us it seems very long and in the short time that we're here we waste a lot of time that we could be used that could be used in our hearts serving God because we get off focused and we get focused on the things of this earth and we get where the entire earth and the things about the world we revolve around those things and we no longer are heavenly minded or we don't have a heavenly vision. And we get off focused. And uh, if we realize the joy that will be in heaven, joy uh, that it surpasses anything that we understand on this earth, our affections would be that direction. And as you go in life, as you get older in life, if you're a Christian, your affection should start swinging much more toward heaven. I've noticed that with my life. I mean, I've always prayed that the Lord will come back and the Lord will go to heaven. But I, I've never looked forward to heaven more than what I do today. And as life goes by, you look forward more and more to going to heaven. There are certain joys in heaven. Now, the first joy I want to mention in heaven, or knowing, having your affections in heaven, is first of all, knowing that you are going there. Amen. Knowing that you're going there. Now, this is, for the Christian, this should not be a doubtful thing, or a hopeful thing. This should be a knowing thing. I know when I die, I'm going to heaven. I know that. I'm not worried about it. I look forward to the new home that I have in heaven. That somewhere, someday I'm going to walk across over Jordan and go to heaven. I look forward to that home just like on this earth we look forward to certain events. I look forward to the day that I marry Mona. Now I look forward to that. I look forward to going to Romania. Those are certain short stepping stones in this life that I look forward to. But you know what I really look forward to? The day I go to heaven. That's the day I look forward to. The day that I, or the day that the Lord comes back and calls me home to heaven in the rapture. Whether I die or whether I'm raptured out, either one's just fine with me. I look forward to the day I go to my new home. That's something that I'm not hoping for. That's something I'm looking forward to. Take your Bible and turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And look how it's something that you should know. 
It's not something that you should hope for. I go door knocking sometime. I say, if you died tonight, will you go to heaven or hell? And they'll say, well, I hope I go to heaven. Well, that's the wrong answer. Someone will say, I'm trusting in the blood of Jesus. I've put my faith in Christ. I'll go to heaven. That's the right answer. That's the right answer. If your faith is in the right thing, you have the right destination. If you don't know, maybe your faith's not in the right thing. Maybe it's in your own righteousness. You say, well, I hope I'm good enough. Well, then your faith's in your own righteousness. Guess what? You're not going to make it. Your righteousness is not good enough to get you to heaven. If you're, yeah, if, if you're trusting in your own righteousness, it'll be a hope so, not a no so. Because you're not very righteous. And so the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, if your hope's in Jesus Christ, then it's a no so. Now, look at uh, John chapter 14. The Bible says, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Man, if I was trusting in my own righteousness, it'd be troubled a whole lot. <sighs> Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for what? You. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Now, is Jesus Christ a liar? No. Well, then for those who are following him and trusting him, he's gone to prepare a place for you and he will come again. And receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? In other words, Thomas is sitting there, old doubting Thomas, man, he has a problem. He's always got to question the Lord. The Lord tells his disciples, I'm going to die and rise again. They say, not so, Lord. You know, they, they didn't have the understanding of eternal security at that point. <laughs> they didn't. But the Lord comes back and he shows Thomas the hands. Hey, you know what Thomas says? He says, my Lord and my God, all doubts were wiped away with old Thomas at that point. Now look what Jesus Christ tells them in John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I think that's one of the greatest gospel verses in the Bible. Amen. Jesus Christ is your only way. Amen. You say, well, there's many ways and they all have the same destination. Baloney! That's baloney. I don't care how many ways you slice it. It still comes out baloney. There's one way. And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You want to get to heaven? You put your absolute trust in Jesus Christ alone to say. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Put your faith in him. Quit trusting in religion. Say, well, I joined the Baptist church. I was born a Baptist. I was raised a Baptist and I'll die a Baptist. And if you don't put your full trust in Jesus Christ, you'll go to hell a Baptist. <clears throat> Being a Baptist doesn't save you. Being a Catholic doesn't save you. Being a church of Christ doesn't save you. Putting your full faith in Jesus Christ alone saves you. Amen. Have you put your trust in Him? He said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Catholic that puts his full trust in Jesus Christ is a saved Catholic, and he'll be in heaven just like you and I. Amen. I don't put too much emphasis on religion. You say, well, why are you a Baptist then? Because they believe the closest thing to what I believe the Bible says. So I affiliate myself with them. But you know what I am before I'm a Baptist? I am a Bible believer. I believe this book. I don't believe what some religion teaches about it. I don't believe what some man teaches about it. I believe what God writes about it. Take your Bible and turn to 1 John chapter 5. Now if you want a great verse, a great verse on eternal security, 
you want 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. There's a lot of great verses. You know, uh, when I got saved, I was a six-year-old boy. And I just knew I was going to hell, and I wanted to know how to be saved. My sister said, oh, that's simple. You put your trust in Jesus Christ, ask Him to save you, and He'll save you. So that's what I did. And just like any Christian, the devil comes along after you get saved and tries to get you to doubt that Jesus Christ would actually save you. So through that first week after I got saved, I kept praying and asking God to save me because I kept doubting whether or not I was saved or not and I was going to hell. And I had memorized John 3.16 as a kid. And I remembered the Holy Spirit bringing up that verse and asking, well, it says everlasting. How long is everlasting? Now, if I can understand at six years old how long everlasting is, how come you can? If you have everlasting life, that means you have it. And it's everlasting. It never goes away. That's the verse I got eternal security on. But here's one that's a little bit better. Go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, let's pick up verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, now underline it, that ye may hope, no, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, if we ask anything according to His will, will he heareth us. You know, as a Christian, I put my faith in Jesus Christ, I accept Him, I know I have eternal life. Why? Because I'm trusting Him, not myself. I'm trusting Him, not my religion. I'm trusting Him, not my country. I'm trusting Him, not the Word of Man. I'm trusting Him. Now, do you get it? Do you, got, do you trust Him? Have you accepted Him? Have you received Him as your Savior? Have you put your faith in Him alone to save you? Was there a time where you came to Jesus Christ and you said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Will you please save me from hell and wash my sins away? I'll put my trust in you alone. Now if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You're saved by what you believe in, not by what you do. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Nathaniel, do you know what a free gift is? I got a free gift in my hand. Do you want this free gift? You want the free gift. Do you know what you have to have to get this free gift? You know what you need to do? You need to believe that I'll give it to you if you'll come up and accept it. Will you accept the free gift? You're going to accept it. Well, if I say no, you have to take and do all the mowing. Then it's not free. Miriam, you want the free gift? Come get the free gift. Come get it. You want it? You have to receive it. Come get it. Oh, she's going to turn it down. If you turn down the free gift, you don't get it. Nathaniel, do you want the free gift? It's a pocket knife. <laughs> All right, <laughs> it's a free gift. <laughs> now she's upset because she didn't receive the free gift. Let me tell you, you get to a great white throne judgment and you don't receive the free gift of eternal life, you're going to be upset. You're going to be upset. You see how that works. Salvation's the same way. Salvation. Now, Miriam, do you want the free gift? Do you want a free gift? Oh, yeah, that's a good thing. It's a pocket. <laughs> All right. That's a free gift. Uh, you keep that pocket knife closed, young lady. <laughs> so, <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> but, uh, 
I know. There's a, you know, a lot of people don't want the free gift. There's a story D.L. Moody used to tell. It's just a made-up illustration story. But there's a beautiful swan that comes flying down from heaven to the earth and it lands along this pond. And here's a stork out in the pond. And it's just walking along the edge of the pond in the lily pads, sticking its nozzle down in the mud, picking up smells and swallowing them down. And it notices uh, this beautiful white swan landing down on the shoreline there and looks at the swan and says, where'd you come from? The swan says, well, I came to heaven. And I said, go, don't, never heard of heaven. What's, what's heaven? He says, oh, it's a beautiful place. There's no sin there. There's no filth. Everything's pure. Everything's white. The streets are gold. There's a river that flows that gives life. And it comes out of the throne of God. God is there. He sits there. And everything's perfect in heaven. That old star. Boop. Boop. Is there any snails in heaven? Boop. Swan says, well, I don't, I don't know if there's any snails in heaven. Boop. I don't want to go. Boop. I just want snails. Boop. You know what that is? Pleasures of this world. The pleasures of this world. Many of us are so concerned about this short life and our own belly and the pleasures of this own world and the pleasures of sin for a season that we don't even want heaven, the greatest place that there is. Why? Because we enjoy our sin. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. You know why men don't go to heaven? Because they love the snails and they choose this world over heaven. It's your choice. I know I'm going to heaven. Why? Because I made my choice and I put my faith in Jesus Christ. What's your choice? Will you receive them or reject them? Number two, I, and this goes along with that illustration, I want to go to heaven because there's joy in heaven because there's no more sin. Can you imagine a place where there is no sin? No sin. You know, every war that this world goes through is because of sin. Every war. Ever since Cain whacked Abel in the head, man has been whacking each other in the head ever since. Why? Because of sin. Because of sin. There's always somebody out there that has to be corrected. Or there's always somebody out there that wants the blessings of others through covetousness. So there's two reasons you have war. One reason is a man wants something that doesn't belong to him. Palestine will always be in war because there's always people that want Palestine, but God gave it to someone else. So that war will always be fought. We're going to be, bring peace to the Middle East. There's only one person that's going to bring peace to the Middle East. And he comes back right here. Second coming of Christ. You're not going to bring peace to the Middle East. But that's why there's war. Because of sin. So covetousness. Somebody wants something that someone else has. Or the other reason to have war is to stop the person that wants something that they don't want to have. Okay. You know, many a times, Americans' wars are legit. Why? Because we're trying to help the helpless. There is a certain amount of righteousness to that. And you, if you want God's blessing, you should do that. You know, I'm not against the wars that we get into many times. I am against the way we do it. I mean, if you're going to have to go to war, do it right. Don't play games. Amen. And don't sit there and play games where we're in a, what do they call it? A, no, we're in a war. Either we stay out of it or we're in war. And if we're in war, we go in and we take and make it happen. No, uh, don't, don't pull the punch. America pulls the punch a lot of times. So that's where I disagree with them. But I don't, I don't disagree with the wars we get. You know, the Korea War was necessary. I think it was necessary. 
I think the Vietnam War was necessary. I think the uh, Iraq War was necessary. I think the war on terrorism and the Afghan War is necessary. I don't disagree with the reason we got into the war. I disagree with the way we go about it. I think we could do it much better. You go into a country, you take the country, you control the country, and you run the country. And if they didn't want that, then they shouldn't have made us come over in the first place. But what we do is we take the country, we rebuild it, we give it back to them. Then we got to go in in another 10 years and take it again. <laughs> because we never run it. Anyways, I'm getting into politics now. I need to quit doing that. <laughs> back to the Bible where I'm safe. <laughs> All right. Do joy is no more sin. Revelation 21, 20 says, it says, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You say, yeah, but Christians are sinners. Yes, but that Christian goes through a remodeling process. He gets a new mind, a new heart, and a new body. And the one that goes to heaven is perfect. There'll be no more sin. You know, I'm going to have a body and a mind that doesn't sin anymore. Oh boy, won't that be the day. I don't have to worry about what I think no more. No, today, the thought of foolishness is sin. My mind, I have to cast down imaginations all the time because of the sin of the nature of my body. Sin of the nature of my flesh. But one day I don't have to worry about that. I look forward to heaven because God's going to take the sin away from me. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, it says, And ye know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. You know, when we go to heaven, we're going to be in him. There will be no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. You know what happens? Our soul is in him, and that's sinless when we get saved. But our flesh, it ain't in him right now. And every time you sin, you step away, from, get your eyes off the Lord and step away from him and go do the sin that you want to do. But if you abide in him, guess what? You won't sin. Guess what? When we go to heaven will be abiding in Him for eternity. There will be no more sin. No more sin. Won't that be great? Won't that be great? Everything you do is right. Don't even have to think about it. You just do the right thing all the time. Man, that's something to look forward to. That's something to look forward to. You know, one of the terrible things about sin is the guilt that follows. The guilt that follows. How many of you ever had a guilty conscience? Won't have to worry about that in heaven. Oh, won't that be great? That, won't be, that will be a great thing where we will not have to have a guilty conscience anymore. You don't have to fight or resist sin anymore. You don't have to live with the guilt of sin. You don't have to have the presentation of sin given to you anymore. You know, in Deuteronomy, when them children of Israel come in, it says, you need to burn all the cities, destroy all the inhabitants of the land, and burn all the idols and get rid of all the images. Why? Because God didn't want the presentation of the filthiness and wickedness of the people of the land to be presented to their people who were supposed to be a righteous people and a peculiar people that wholly followed Him. It is one of the most difficult things to be God's righteous man and peculiar man that fully follows Him and walks through this world seeing all the images that I see. I have the presentation of sin all the time. I'm sitting there, I tell the kids, they want to watch a new cartoon. So I said, well, you got to watch that cartoon. Let's see, I want to watch it with you. And I'm constantly making my children, with their children videos, fast forward it. Because of the presentation of sin. 
and children's videos. Are you kidding me? Why would they put that in a children's video? Presentation of sin. It's everywhere. One of these days, I don't have to worry about the presentation of sin no more. I'll be in heaven. There is no presentation of sin. Boy, ain't that something to look forward to. Man, if you don't look forward to that, there's something wrong with you. Something to look forward to. The joy, number three, you know why I want to go to heaven, my affections are in heaven, because the joy of the fellowship of those in heaven. The joy of the fellowship of those in heaven. You know one thing, one joy that I'm going to have is the joy of meeting my converts. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know, one of these days I'm going to see the fruit for my labor. I'm going to see how many people got saved due to my passing out tracts, due to my witnessing, and the souls that I've saved in door knocking or street preaching. One of these days I'm going to get to meet them all. And look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. That's going to be a joyful thing. Uh, actually, I think it's uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. You know, every person that you influence for Jesus Christ is going to be a joyful thing in heaven. I can't imagine somebody... I mean, I want to take and meet the first convert I ever won to the Lord in heaven. He was uh, some black kid up in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, up by Nashville. Won him to the Lord on a playground. I want to see whatever become of that young boy. Met him one time, never met him again. Well, one of these days, he's going to walk up in the streets of Lord and say, Hey, thank you for telling me Jesus saves. Thank you for giving me the gospel. He's in heaven because I told him how to go. That's joy. Joy in heaven. Do you look forward to heaven because there's some people that you point at that direction that you're going to meet there? Put all these gospel tracts out. You know how many of you help with the Christmas parade and putting all them gospel tracts out? The Bible says that, that doesn't, the Word of God doesn't come back void. You're going to see some fruit. You say, well, I haven't seen it here. That's why it's going to be so joyful up there because that's when we see our fruit. That's when we see the production of our labors. It's joy. I want to see the production of my labor. You say, how many have you won? I don't know. I do not know. I mean, I can remember a number of them. I can remember a number of young men in the juvenile detention centers. I can remember a number of people outdoor knocking and stuff. If I was to guess, I'd say 50. I've maybe won 50 if I was to guess of the ones that I knew. But boy, I'm interested in the ones I don't know about. That's the ones I want to see. That's the fruit I want to see. First of all, you get to meet your converts. Then you get to meet the saints that have gone on before. You know, when Jesus Christ goes to the Mount of Transfiguration, there was two saints that come down and meet him, Moses and Saint Elijah. And they sit there and talk to him. They have a good time. And Peter, not knowing what to say, hey, can let's build three booths. No, you ain't there to glorify the saints, but you can have fellowship with them. I mean, you're glorifying Jesus Christ. You know, I'd like to walk up to Ezekiel and talk to Ezekiel. Say, Ezekiel, you sure went through a lot. How'd you go through that? You ever study the man Ezekiel in the Bible? You talk about a peculiar individual. <laughs> I mean, Ezekiel was different. To me, Ezekiel is one of my role models in the Bible. He did whatever he was told to do without argument. I'll tell you, that's a character. Ezekiel, well, I'd say without argument, Ezekiel was human. 
<laughs> I mean, he couldn't eat man's dung. Lord had gracious with him, and he made his cakes out of cow dung. Oh, well, you know. But you talk, you talk about dedication. Ezekiel had dedication. You know, you ever want to sit down and have a Bible study with Paul? Yeah. You ever want to talk about fighting with Joshua? You ever want to talk about prayer with Daniel? You talk about fellowship. I mean, there's the cream of the crop. The saints have gone, hey, you ever, you want to sit down and talk to those who are in the Fox's Book of Martyr that gave their lives and went out on the rack and went through the fire? Wesley, John Huff, D.L. Moody. You have these favorite preachers. You know, one day I'll be able to sit down with Bob Jones Sr. I've read his books and his wisdom be able to just talk to him, hear his wisdom. You know, the saints that's gone on before, having fellowship with them. The fellowship of loved ones that's gone on before. You know, I have some grandparents that are in heaven. I have a father that's in heaven. I have a wife that's in heaven. And boy, you better expect I look forward to the day that I get to see her again. The more they go over there, the less attractive this seems. The more attractive that seems. Boy, there will be joy in heaven. The Lord has a short time for me to stay. And I'll stay and I'll serve Him. I'm not trying to leave before my time. But boy, I look forward to the day. I look forward to the day. Do you? There will be joy in heaven. And last of all, we get to see the Lord. Boy, I want to go up to the One who died for me and loved enough to take my sin on Him, who loved me like no others loved me. And I get to see Him face to face. And I get to know Him in a way that I've never been able to know Him. I get to praise Him and glorify Him and worship Him and kneel down at His actual feet. Boy, I look forward to that day. There ain't nothing on this earth that I want to stay for to prevent me from doing that. If you want to stay on this earth and not go to heaven and kneel and cast a crown before the Lord Jesus Christ and sing praises and shout praises to Him, there's something wrong with you. You got too much of a taste of this earth. This earth is not that nice. Yeah, there's things on this earth you can enjoy while you're here. But boy, it ain't nothing like heaven. It's nothing like heaven. Why would you not want to go to heaven? I will never understand. And last of all, in heaven you have the joys and pleasures forever of being in God's presence. Turn to Psalms chapter 16. Psalms chapter 16. Psalms chapter 16. And look at verse 11. Psalms chapter 16, verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. You know, when I get to heaven, the greatest thing about heaven is I'm in God's presence all the time. You know, here it seems like we step out of His presence. Job, in Job chapter 23, it says, I looked to the right hand, I couldn't find Him. I looked to the left, I couldn't find Him. He hid Himself as from me when I tried to find Him. It's like the Lord hid Himself. And the Lord's, we know the Lord's everywhere, but you know, we can't always see His presence. We don't always feel His presence. His presence isn't always made known to us on this earth. Job's like, I want to find his presence. I'd like to talk to him. I'd like to reason with him. I'd like to know why this stuff is happening. Yeah, so would I, Job. There's some things on this earth I don't understand. And I'd like to know the reason. But his presence, the knowledge of his presence isn't complete yet. But boy, there will be a day. There will be a day where I'll stand before Him and I'll understand everything as He understands them. 
I'll see everything the way He says them. I'll be perfect in knowledge because the one perfect in knowledge will be right in front of me. And He can tell me everything I want to know. He can open up my understanding. In His presence, there is joy forevermore. I will never doubt anything. I'll never be sad about anything. I'll never have to cry about anything. The Bible says he takes all tears will be wiped from their eyes. Boy, that ends in right now. You want to hang on to this with the pain, the sorrow, the tears, the loneliness, the sin, the crying, because you like the snails? Is that snail really that good? Is the snail really that good? I don't think so. I don't think so. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Is the joys of heaven something that you look forward to? Say, I want to go to heaven. Well, the Bible says about Jesus Christ, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man calleth unto the Father but by me. If you have not put your full trust in Jesus Christ alone to save you, you're not going to heaven. The Bible says that any man that rejects Jesus Christ is under condemnation and the wrath of God abideth on him. There is the other message, and that's the terrors of hell. You have the joys of heaven, but you also have the terrors of hell. And people go one of two places. With Jesus Christ, they go to heaven. Without Him, they go to hell. You say, you're a hellfire damnation preacher? Yes, I am. The word hell shows up over 50 times in the Bible. And many more times it's described as a place of torment, a place of wrath, and a lake of fire. It's real, just like heaven's real. These are not figments of my imagination. They're real places. But I chose heaven when I chose Jesus Christ. And you have a choice. Will you choose Jesus Christ and Him alone? Put your faith in Him. Let's have a song of invitation.